Welcome to the newest edition of Office Hours. Thank you so much for joining us. Today we are going to talk about HR and why it's so important for businesses of all shapes and sizes. Um, I'm joined today by Carol Frazier. She is the founder of C4 Talent. Uh, she is a bit of a Swiss army knife of HR. She has been there, done that, done it with excellence, executed for clients, and uh, really gotten them in shape as far as what they need to prepare for, plan for, and uh, set their business up for success with HR. Um, we're also joined uh, by a couple of other guests, and I'm sure there's others that are watching Incognito as well. So thank you for joining uh, Dr. Crudy and Sherry Wheat. Um, as you have questions or comments, please share them. Anyone else listening, uh, please share them in chat as well. So Carol, let me give you a proper introduction other than that little blurb. Uh, you and I have met, uh, or we, we've been um, kind of collaborating for about 18 months and you are my go-to person for everything HR. Absolutely. In fact, um, you are uh, a key collaborator in a weekly mastermind that uh, we participate in, and of course, Crudy's in that too, for supporting business owners. So tell us a little bit about everything that business owners need to consider when they ask themselves, is my business too small to need HR? It's a good question. And thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate being in a forum where I can help small business owners. It is something that I have done since 2000. Uh -huh. And whether you have one employee or I've had clients that were Sony Pictures, Disney Publishing, GFK Market Research, big, huge clients. So there are definitely different things that you need to consider about human resources. But the one thing I will say is if you have one employee, you need some component of human resources. So most small business owners, when they are, you know, they start their business and they're more of a craftsman owner, like, so they are really good at their specialty and then they decide to start a business. They could be amazing leaders, which means that in their mind, they're thinking, I'm great at HR. Well, being, you know, an engaging, aspiring leader is a component that we support organizations with. However, there is a slew of other things that everybody needs to know. I mean, I talk about the fact that there are at least 26 distinct specialties in human resources. And that's just because I know I can get a certification in 26 different things <laughs> in human resources. Now, I've gotten a lot of those, but not all of them. Yeah. And uh, this, but then there are things that just don't even have a certification arm yet that again, you as business owners are going to need to be aware of. So if you even have one employee, what you're going to have to take into consider is payroll employee handbook, compliance, maybe health insurance. It's not required by the ACA. And then of course, how are you going to continue to onboard, communicate, educate, right? So payroll in and of itself is a specialty that you can get certified in. And so it does have a lot of components that, you know, maybe you want to partner with a PEO to manage some of that risk. Um, maybe you're like, I don't even want to go that far because I don't want to pay the admin fees and I'm just going to have it run through my QuickBooks. Uh, but you do need to make sure that you understand some nuances. Uh, and then again, in certain states, there's reporting things that you need to consider. If you so have let, let me ask you yeah. a quick question that I know a lot of our <laughs> listeners are asking because because many people that uh, watch and follow the Go Go Grow uh, coaching podcast, they are the the small medium sized businesses, they're startups, scale ups. Yep. What is PEO? Haha, -ha. it's a uh, thank you. It's a partnered a partner employee organization. I believe it is. It, the idea is that you are co employing your own employees. Now, in my opinion, IMO it's not my favorite thing. Um, because they're a little risk adverse, 
but they do help to mitigate risk when it comes to things like the health insurance costs or ensuring that your payroll taxes are done appropriately. Um, so the idea here is that they actually are employees of the PEO and then they're given back to you and you manage those employees. It's a unique thing that kind of came around Again, this is going to show my age. It's a unique thing that came around in the kind of early 2000s um, where they started kind of popping up because health insurance started to kind of get higher costs. Yes. And the only people who could take advantage of lower costs were large employers and a large employer is 100 people or more. And so for anybody under that, they were seeing huge increases. And that's because in the benefits world, you're based off of how much benefit you use, right? Insurance is a funny little thing. You know, we all pay into things like car insurance, pet insurance, whatever. And then you're just sitting there hoping that you never need it. But then when you do need it, they jack up your rates. That's what happens. And when you only have 10 or 20 employees and half of them are actually using the benefits you offer them, your rates go through the roof. It's just cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. But that <laughs> idea is where the PEOs kind of came into play. But again, you, sometimes it's a good thing. Sometimes it's a double-edged sword. You got to really weigh the costs. I always tell my clients, go with the PEO if you don't want to put in the effort of honestly looking at your payroll every paycheck, you know, every every run, making sure your taxes are done, making sure your reporting is done. If, if you are a smart owner and you are not doing, you're not working on the business, you're, you're in the business, you're, you're What's that? You're not working in the business. You're working on the business. Um, then you, you will <laughs> you will find somebody to do all of that, right? So that's one thing. But now with the advent of this fractional world, you can get the benefits of what the PEOs offer without with still having the ownership of your employees, but you get True. the intelligence and the expertise of a fractional HR person. And I think that when you're an owner and you're thinking, look, I, I, I love the partnering aspect. I love the risk mitigation aspect, but I don't like the fact that, you know, it's just an admin cost. I have to use their system and their system is janky or whatever, right? Now you've got options. You've got options to go get your own system, get a fractional partner, and, and really be able to manage your business even more so than having a PEO, you know, tell you a little bit about how to run your business. So let me come back to some of that huge bucket of knowledge that you dropped on us earlier. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you said if, if you have one or more employees, okay. So many business owners, and I'm I'm pretty sure all four of us fell into this category at once. It was just us. Yeah. We started our business as just us. And, you know, maybe it turned out to be then us and a family member or us and a buddy or um, maybe a, a couple of 1099s or something like that. So we may think, well, we don't have any employees what does a business owner in that situation need to think about for HR? It's a really good question. And that's one of the questions I get most of the time is, you know, I've just got some 1099ers that are working for me. And that's typical. And here's where I say it's all dependent upon your level of risk that you enjoy. <laughs> Do you want to, are you risk adverse or are you, are you a loving risk? Um, you want to make sure you have some basics in place. So if you're not, if you're only payrolling yourself and you're working with your accountant, then, you know, you've got that portion covered. When it comes to the handbook, though, the reason why I would always recommend the basic, basic, basic policies is because your 1099ers, even though they're not your employees, you still want to have expectations, behavior expectations in place, even for your 1099ers, because if those 1099ers are talking to your clients, you want to make sure that you've shared your harassment and discrimination policy with them. Yes. Because that is something that I feel everybody knows is a basic and everybody knows that you can have a conversation about it. But if you don't have something written down that kind of talks about the procedure component of if my client complains about my 1099, what am I going to do? 
by having something written down, everybody knows what's going to happen. We all know that I'm going to talk to them. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to mitigate if it goes into, you know, a gross misconduct. You know, what does that mean to your contract? Not very many people have that nuance within their contract, their 1099 contract. So having a policy that you share and say, you're just, you have to know, even as it's not an employee policy, it is a business policy, honestly. If you think about it, we as vendors are required to follow our clients' yeah, harassment yeah. and discrimination policies. Why that person, that 1089er is a vendor to you. So you better equip them with the information of what you expect their standards of behavior to look like. So, so I've, I've got a I've got a question for um Sherry and Crudy and anyone else that may be following along um on chat. Um of course I've used a lot of 1099s in the past 15 years. Um, a lot of what I've done has been seasonal, so it's made sense to use 1099s. And I've had an attorney drafted 1099, 1099 agreement. And it's covered things like compensation and confidentiality and uh, recipro reciprocity and all of that. I've still had some issues that I had to put my management hat on and my uh, my client service hat on and, and deal with. So Sherry, um, Crudy, have you, have you used 1099s and, and what's been your experience, positive or negative, from an HR perspective? Uh, that's I've used a lot of 1099s and I'm lucky. Um, I have a bunch of them that have stayed with me for years and I've okay. never had issues. I've never had issues. And part of it was that I wanted them to be happy in the work that they were doing so that they were working on projects that they liked and they were working the time availability that they had. So it was more, imp it was important and sometimes more important that they be happy because if they were, my clients were happy. So, um, but I, I can see there's some areas I need to tighten up on. I've been very fortunate. Well, that's the purpose of, a, of an interactive coaching office hour. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Thank you, Miss Michelle. Absolutely. I'll what jump on what Sherry just said yeah. real quick, though. Uh, and look, I kind of approach this. So I could get very legal and I could scare a lot of people because I usually do a, a, a seminar probably twice a year with a law firm. And we kind of show them the different kind of mindsets between if you were to partner with an HR person and just know that you've got somebody in your back pocket versus having to call an attorney when you've got a problem. Yeah. Um, it's we proactive. We <laughs> we approach things very differently. So for example, a lawyer could say, um, if your 1099s are working on your primary business, they're not 1099. Because the definition, and by the way, the definition changed this year in March. So oh. if you weren't aware that the federal government revised what, what 1099 means, I suggest you go online and check it out. It was in March of 2024. The idea here is if you are using 1099ers to deliver your primary business, they are not 1099. Action item for all um, utilizers of 1099 talent. Yes. Definitely. If that 1099 has you and you only as their client, they're an employee, period, mm -hmm. end of story. It, it, and it goes down to not, I would say, and you read the language, I, I like to give that kind of furthest definition because let's say they do have two clients, but you are 80% of their revenue and somebody else is 20% of their revenue. They're still an employee. So wow. look, nobody's going to come knocking on your door yet. And I'll tell you why, mm -hmm. but these are the kinds of things that if you talk to an HR person, one, I'm half, if not less than half the cost of an attorney to give you this <laughs> advice <laughs> and to help you walk through it and to help you update. 
a 1099 contract, right? To be able to clearly say you're attesting that I am not your primary income and make them sign that because it's not your job to go after them and say, I want to see all of your clients. But the contract itself needs to better outline what the IRS definition of that 1099 is. And when they sign that contract, they're attesting to it. And you are more off the hook, right? Never That's fully, critical, but you're more yeah. off the hook. Um, the other thing is when you have somebody, as you had said, Sherry, for, you know, you've had them for years, we need to ask ourselves, okay, I, I could have a marketing agency, right? For years, that's not my primary business. So there are certain things that you could always have for years and years and years as a 1099. But there are some things, like you said, Michelle, seasonal, that's totally okay too. You could have a seasonal person working on your core business due to the influx of overflow that you needed, what have you. And you're not going to get, you know, in the red, so to speak, or in the, in the scary area because it's seasonal. When that seasonal hits six months or more, then we have to ask ourselves, did your business just shift and now they're working on your core business and now maybe they're not an employee. And you got to think about the different implications other than that, because when somebody's an employee, payroll taxes, unemployment taxes, social security taxes, all of those things that you haven't paid into. Yeah. And that's where we start to get the financial exposure. So Prudy, have you had experience either hiring uh, and utilizing 1099s or, or perhaps being a 1099 resource yourself? Well, I think I do my 1099s differently because they're purely project-based and it is just literally for the tax protection purposes that we fill out the 1099. But I have not entered, I mean, there are some startups and stuff that I work with, but they're not on a 1099 basis right now because my role is not a 1099 role, like Carol said. So those right. are different kinds of contracts. They're part-time work contracts, but they are not necessarily 1099. Now, that being said, it's possible that some of that income gets reported as 1099, depending on the structure that those clients end up following right. at the end of the year. But they're in the startup phase. So there's a lot of move, moving parts. Um, and they, they do have HR people and attorneys. So Okay. But in terms of my own contract, that's not a 1099 contract or there's not a long-term contract. It's based on a project, usually not even based on hours. It's, this is what I'm going to do and for this rate. Yeah. Um, and that really um, helps, like Carol said, because it, for one thing, I know Carol. <laughs> <laughs> if it gets to a point it's like oh dude i i don't i need somebody to look this over right but i haven't gotten to that point yet and like sherry said some of these people that i have worked with i've worked with them for 10 12 15 years and so that project based 1099 works independently and great because that that's I'm not their driving, I'm not a major part of their business processes. Mm -hmm. It's just based on when we need you and right. what we need you for. So I think that's the beauty about being in data. Nobody really trusts you to do everything. <laughs> <laughs> the the project, when you have defined start and end dates, when you have defined deliverables, all of those kinds of things really easy, right? And I know yeah. a lot of people are like, but that's what I do with my 1099s. I get an intake to client and that's the project. And yes, I would say you're not wrong. If that is it, like, for example, my business is offering HR services. When I contract people in, I have them for a period of time. I am not risk adverse. I love risk. And so when I know if something were to start to go beyond six months, if I signed a 12 month contract with someone, I'll put myself on, and this is just advice for people, I'll put myself on as the primary. And then the other people are supporting me 
as needed on a project basis. It's really, this is why I say, you know, you could spend a lot of money with lawyers writing very specific SOWs to your 1099 contract, or you could just be proactive and go, hey, Carol, how do I make this work so that I my nose is clean, you know? And you just need to know how to organize your business so that you can mitigate risk through strategic understanding of how to run your business with people. I mean, let's face it, if we're, I'm not a product company, I'm a service company. I need people to run my business. And even if I am an engineering company or a software developer company, I still need people. And it's the people side that's the stickiest side. And like yeah. Sherry kind of alluded to, nothing can go wrong, right? You're perfectly fine until the day you're not. Yeah. And then That's you're awesome. like, well, there goes my business. All for that one day, all that energy, effort, love, commitment, it's gone. And that's where I think a lot of people are risk. Uh, you know, they're not risk adverse. They they love the risk. And they're like, I'm going to keep going until it doesn't. And this is what I was going to come back to. So over COVID, like 2022-ish, uh, the Department of Labor decided to bring on a I think it was some really lovely number, like 30,000 new uh, agents in the Department of Labor. And they were hired specifically to look into small businesses. You and, know, the heartbeat of America, the one that drives the majority right. of uh, the, the gross domestic product. Yep, <laughs> yep. And it's not, it, it is for the purposes of what we're talking about right now, the 1099 or it's for tax purposes, guys. It's for tax purposes. They're not trying to put you out of business, but here's what I would say to anybody listening. If the Department of Labor knocks on your door and says, hi, I'm John from the Department of Labor. You clearly say, great, John, give me your card. I'll have my people call you. Do not invite them in no matter how lovely they are, no matter how great you think you're set up, like you have the handbook and you have the required postings and you have all that stuff, no matter how great you think you are set up, if the Department of Labor ever knocks on your door, if the IRS ever knocks on your door, thank you very much. Give me your card. I'll have my people contact you. Do not invite them in. I just had a client that I did a huge project with them because they got an IRS letter and it was an IRS letter around benefits, which we talked about briefly. You don't, we're not required to have them for one employee. You are required when you hit 50 full-time equivalent employees. And that's why these people got the letter. They had not done their 1094s, 1095s. And they said, but none of our people are full-time. I said, well, then what are you worried about? So the funny thing was, is it was their broker who called me and they're like, so who's supposed to do the 1094s and 1095s? And I said, well, usually HR does that because they manage payroll and benefits. Well, what if they don't have HR? <laughs> who, who manages payroll? Well, their bookkeeper. Okay. Well, does the bookkeeper, did their bookkeeper do that? Uh, no. Okay. Okay. Did they go through your benefits portal when they decided to have, some people had benefits and they said, uh, no, they did paper. And I'm like, okay, so you Oy. really <laughs> screw the pooch on that one, right? <laughs> I had to literally audit. Th this was a company, um, develop uh, business development and management company. And so they had 20 subsidiaries, little small companies, right? Because right. every building is its own company. And so they have all of these small buildings and all these small companies. And I had to do an analysis that was, I was pretty proud of myself. Um, and I, you know, I had to go through and look at, they were not tracking time. So here we are trying to say they're not full-time, but they weren't tracking time. IRS is going to go, well, then they're full-time period. <laughs> so, um, had to go through, had to get their time, had to find all these things. We finally got the IRS letter back yesterday. Uh, we, we sent in the first one. They came back and said, we need more. We sent in even more data. They came back and they said, okay, thank you very much. You're right. You're not a large employer. You know that not, you don't have to worry about that. That would have cost them. So they had 200 plus employees part-time, wow. $3,600 an employee. That was just for one year. Oh, wow. Had they not found somebody, HR is usually the one guys, it's not a lawyer. It's definitely not the lawyer. 
clearly if your accountant understands it, maybe, but this particular company's accountant didn't understand it. The benefits guy is like, I know they're supposed to do it, but I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Like you need somebody who like actually enjoys this crap. That's HR. (laughs) Well, uh, we are running a little bit uh, low on time, but Carol, there are three things that we talked about when we were kind of trying to figure out what kind of value that we wanted to add and and everything that we wanted to encompass. So I want to touch on each of the three very briefly. Now, we are going to have uh, another office hours same time next week. Um, So it will be Wednesday, the, what is that? The 21st at 2 p.m. And the format is going to be come with your questions. Um, We've shared a lot with you today. Certainly that sparked ideas, questions, concerns, and feedback. So come with that next week. We'll be happy to tackle it. If you are watching this recording, um, jot down your notes, put a comment on the post, email us, send us a message through LinkedIn, whatever it is. Um, Don't really get smoke signals, but you can try. (laughs) But let me share, excuse me, let me share the three items um, that you and I talked about, Carol, and we'll go further into them next week. But one statement you said, and I'm gonna leave this and, and we'll dig in next week. You shared, if you're setting up simply to be compliant, it's not going to grow with you because every single time you add a person to your organization, your company changes. Absolutely. So I definitely want to dig into that next week. Okay. Um, something Sherry said, and I thought this was so critical because it really touched on something that you and I talked about. She said that it is as important for her team members to be happy and satisfied and enjoy their work, just as important as her clients to be happy and satisfied. And one of the things you, yes. (laughs) uh, And one of the things you and I talked about is creating the culture you want through workforce planning. And if you're looking for a specific client experience, you need to develop that employee experience. Correct. 100%. So Sherry, you are wise beyond your (laughs) your years. (laughs) So um, please um, talk to us about that for for just kind of an outline of what we'll talk about next week, if you would, Carol. So when you think about customer experience or client experience, you need to look backwards to the employee experience. It's... It, there is a direct link. It is not the same, clearly, but how you engage your employees, how you communicate to, with your employees, how you empower them with ways of working, how you ensure that they are equipped and trained and understand where their role fits in, how you better understand their personal motivations and how that lends into productivity at your organization. All of that is business items that directly link to your client retention, your client yes. attraction and your client retention. You know, there's some behemoths out there that have horrible glass door ratings, but they're still very successful. But there is many studies done that clearly see if you were to look at a glass door rating of an organization and look at their client retention rate, you will see a correlation. If you've got, if you're blasted on glass door or you have your employees are using social media, but just not saying your company's name, you know, you can find exactly where they're losing clients and their clients are not satisfied and they're not automatically getting auto renewals or whatever the case may be, right? Or those clients, because they're not getting out of their, whoever's contacting them and who's in charge of them. I have a, a, a friend, person who works in retail, right? She is the head of, empl- of customer experience for a very large retail organization. And when she, they didn't have that job until she got there. When she got there, the first thing, because she's my friend, she looked and said, I need to talk to your head of HR. Cause I need to know what was the employee engagement survey? You've got 25,000 employees. I need to know how happy are the employees because I'll tell you exactly how happy the clients are right now. And so 
that's going to be such a insightful conversation. So please, everybody that's listening, bring your questions, your thoughts, your feedback. Where have you worked in the past that you said, oh, I don't ever want to work in an environment like this. If I'm ever a business owner, which you are now, what am I going to do differently? Last thing, and this is something that Carol's going to be so excited to talk about, and that is the impact that your leadership and emotional intelligence as as the business owner or an executive or any type of leadership role, how that impacts your company, your success, your scalability, and your customer relationships. So yeah. the coaching okay. side of it, you know, the emotional intelligence, you can see all my little, little books back here. <laughs> it's, it's really about your own personal mindset. And look, we all talk about mindset. It's a big word nowadays. So is coaching. It's a big word nowadays. A lot of people are saying it. It's a matter really of how aware are you of your own blockers? How aware are you of how you're showing up and how open are you to maybe looking at it from a different lens? All of that le leads into emotional intelligence. It just, and, and what kind of leader do you want to be? You know, I find that a lot of times everybody has great intentions of being an emotionally intelligent, empathetic, communicative, transaction, transformational leader until something happens in the business and you lose your biggest client or your great idea didn't take off and you dumped a bunch of money into a pitch. Like those are the moments that are going to tell you really what is your mindset? What is your emotional intelligence? When everything's right. going great, emotional intelligence is great. Mindset's great. You know, I'm totally there. I'm a great leader. When you're not in a good place, that's going to tell you right. exactly. To, to put a spin on a very famous quote, in order to affect ch significant change, you need to change yourself. So I'm going to leave you with that. And Thank you so much for joining us, for listening in after the fact, for sharing us. And we have some fantastic office hours coming up. In fact, next month, we have Crudy guesting with us. And we have, uh, we're actually, Crudy, do you want to announce what we're going to talk about? Or should we share that a little bit closer? Um, I, think we should, I think we should share it later. Yeah, we have that webinar next week, though. Oh, you want to share that out? Yeah, I I'll think let you, you. I'll let you introduce it. <clears throat> so, well, it's Michelle's baby. I'm supporting it, but we're doing <laughs> we're doing a webinar on Tuesday, August twentieth. Yes, um, next Tuesday. Yes, and I mean you can find information for that um, on Michelle's page or on my page, but. The webinar is called Gen AI for GTM. And so basically we are trying to see how Gen AI and other AI tools can be used effectively for um, go-to-market strategy and other strategies, but with a da data-led uh, approach. Um, and I'm not a GTM person, but Michelle knows a lot about it a lot. And that's one of those things. Um, and, and I'm I, not a Gen AI person, and that's why I, I, I partner with you on so many things. <laughs> well, that's what I was going to say, but I really am a major AI enthusiast, and I'm really looking forward to um, the webinar on Tuesday. So it's gonna I be hope exciting. I'll see y'all there. Thank you, everyone uh, whose faces we don't see, and thank you so much for Sherry and Crudy for joining us today. We hope to see you many more times again. When you watch this, share your questions, your feedback, your, your conundrums, and we will be happy to address them going forward. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. And going forward, go, go, bro. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. You're welcome.